Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel O'Connor. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Thursday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. I'm Spencer Israel, here with Dennis Dick. Joel O'Connor is out today. I think we mentioned yesterday he is guest hosting Stocks and Shocks this morning in Chicago. So we wish Joel luck is in, in his endeavors there. But we have a market to discuss today. We've got some movers. We've got Equifax continuing to uh, to get hit yesterday, still making 52-week lows. Um, we've, got, we've got some earnings. We've got iRobot. Uh, Juno had that breakout we discussed yesterday. Uh, THC is exploring options. So we've got a lot to get to today, plus two guests on the docket. First one at 835 is Gene Munster, managing partner at Loop Ventures. He's going to talk us through uh, the Apple event from Tuesday and his expectations going forward. And then at 9, we're joined by Sandy Chaikin of Chaikin Analytics. What's up in the markets this morning? S&Ps, futures are at all-time high. What else is new? Same story, different day, 2495.50 is the overnight high. Gold is trading down this morning, hitting overnight low of 1322. We are nearly at the lows of the month in gold, and crude is trading up to around $50, which is the highest we've been at since August 10th. Dennis, how are we doing this morning? Well, we're quiet here again there. We're down a point, but we know how this story ends. We said it yesterday, Spencer, on the show when we were trading down four in the pre-market. We knew we were going to close at all-time highs, and we did. I think we probably close at all-time highs again. The trend is your friend. Obviously, not much of a pullback here, so it's not as bold of a call as it was yesterday, even though it wasn't that bold of a call yesterday. But, I mean, S&P futures just seem to be very resilient um, no matter what. Um but, you know, we always have individual stock movers. It's pretty quiet from an S&P front, but there is a lot of individual movers. Um, EFX, absolute disaster yesterday. We'll get into that in a second. And then we had a lot of ratings changes here as well. I guess it's analysts. I guess, you know, all those analysts are back from their holidays over the summer. They're crunching their numbers and they're coming out with some reports, Spencer, because it seems like we're pretty busy in ratings land. You know, there, there was a several week span, I felt like, at, uh, in August there when nothing was happening in ratings because we had, obviously in earnings season, ratings get, get really quiet and, and sort of and then after that, of course, it was in the end of summer and everyone's out of town. So it was really quiet for like three weeks, three or four weeks in earnings season uh, in, in ratings land. And and now now it's not because we got JP Morgan went crazy today. We got we got a lot of ratings to discuss. I don't know if you want to start off with that or we want to start with Equifax or or where you want to go, because we got a lot going on. As far, as Let's far start as... with the hospital stocks. Well, I'll throw you right under the bus okay. here. Tenna Healthcare, THC, Wall Street Journal reports last night that they are exploring options, which is potentially putting themselves up for sale as well. And if you look at THC, that was trading actively higher there last night, um, over 18 and a half it got up to. It has given back about a dollar of those gains, 1736, a lot of debt there. I think, you know, the market starts thinking, you know, I don't know how likely this is. There was also an analyst, I forget who it was, it just uh, reported through, um, and I saw it go by my stream saying that they didn't think it was likely either. Uh, but, you know, it is getting a little bit of life here this morning, THC, showing a lift here as they are exploring options. Yeah, the exact I, – I think it, it was either the Journal or Dow Jones who, who broke that story. This is around 4.30 yesterday. And then so we have uh, THC trading up on that news, possible sale. Uh, sympathy plays as well. You know, we talk a lot about sympathy plays and what will and will not lead to a sympathy play. Well, this is an example of one happening because we have some other hospital stocks moving. CYH is moving. HCA, UHS. Actually, UHS is flat, but HCA – uh, and CYH are the two big ones that are moving the, in sympathy. Those are direct uh, sympathy plays here. Now, and as of last night, I would have said, you know, this probably has a pretty good chance for a sympathy play, but because it's almost like the Nordstrom repeating itself here from the day before, because remember we had rumors that the Nordstrom deal was going to go through and it's trade mm -hmm. up with the 49 and a half handle. By the morning, it had already given back half those gains, and then you start to think, wow, it's already trending down here in the pre-market. Now people are a little gun shy on the sympathy plays. I feel like it's the same thing here now. I feel like like if this would have still been trading 18 and a half this morning, I think you would have saw nice pops in CYH this morning, nice pops in a stock like HCA, even UHS. But now that it's given back half the gains, I don't know if you're going to see as much sympathy move as you would have if it was trading higher. But, you know, keep an eye on those stocks. I don't know if this kickstarts the sector or not, because uh, this sector has been in the doldrums. So, you know, CYH if you, or THC, if you look at the leader, really hasn't been, you know, a great performer at all. Like we said, it's laden 
with debt. If you look at it, the performer, you know, look at its performance from the last three years. Stock was sixty dollars back in July of 2015. You're talking about a stock that's seventeen dollars here now. So it's been ugly, and all these other shirts look similar here. CYH, if you bring that one up, it was up at sixty dollars in 2015. It's seven bucks. HCA. It was up. Uh, HCA is a little different. You know, it was up at 90. It's only off at 78. A little bit different. Uh, but if you just look UHS2, uh, similar story. A lot of these hospital stocks made their highs in 2015 and have not seen them since. Yeah, you know, all these. I, I guess I hadn't looked at the, the hospital stocks in a while, but, but wow. Is this just a, a symptom of uh, uh uh, healthcare, you know, it could and- be. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of you know things here, you, and I think I think there's a debt issue here too. So you know, a lot of these uh, hospital stocks, you know, it costs a lot to operate a hospital. So a lot of these are you know really loaded with debt as well, and people are gun shy on the debt on a lot of things. You know, look at you know even the way you know you had at one time you know Valiant back in 2015 was 250 bucks, you know, and then the debt starts to get them a little bit. You know, now you're at 14 dollars on VRX where the debt might have actually brought VRX under, but they've started selling off stuff trying to get that debt lower. You know, we obviously saw the same problem here uh, with uh, Teva. Have a pharmaceutical is just loaded with debt. You know, they were buying, you know, other, you know, drugs and acquiring and, you know, buying growth basically. And it eventually comes to bite you in the butt. So, you know, that's a consideration when you're looking at something, you know, especially as an investment, you know, always consider, you know, the debt and consider the way that they're growing because sometimes companies will just, you know, start accumulating a hell of a lot of debt, trying to grow as quickly as they can. But when you're accumulating debt, it's always good to have some debt. You start to get overloaded with it. It can be, you know, become very risky as well. Definitely. Uh, someone in the chat who was asking if, um, let me pull, pull the exact message now, whether one of the stocks we're talking about is a fade. No, no, I lost my spot in the chat. Well, maybe talking THC. I THC, mean, yes, funny. There we go. It, well, it's hard. You know, you look at it now and you think, okay, well, it was a fade last night, just like JWN was a fade when it got up to 49 or 50. But, you know, now it's given back half the gains. I think that trade's kind of over. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, times that you come in. You know, this is one thing to consider. When you only trade intraday, your opportunities are less because, you know, really you have your intraday session. Then you have your after hours session. Then you have your pre-market session, which we're in right now. Then you have your next day. So really between, you know, and, you know, 99% of traders are just intraday traders. They're missing two of the other sessions. And in those two other sessions, that's where the most price discovery happens because that's where you have the most news. I'm a news trader. So that's why I love trading the after hours and I love trading pre-market because I'm participating in that whole price discovery process. Sometimes on the initial headlines, liquidity is lower. You know, and people get excited. They see a oh, potential deal and they buy the hell out of it. But then when you stop and think about it, you're like, wow, this is just a potential for a deal. There's a lot of debt on the table. Who's going to really do this deal? Who wants to go and acquire this company and acquire all that debt as well? And then, you know, you start thinking, well, maybe this is a fade. So I think the fade was obviously last night when the stock was trading in the upper 18s or mid 18s. Now you're at 17 and a half. You're kind of late to the party. You know, there's still it's still good news for shareholders here that they're looking at doing something because the stock's been a dog forever. So, you know, I, I don't know if I'm coming here and selling it short at 17 and a half. If it was to get back up into those 18s again, maybe that gets interesting. But, you know, I think at 17 and a half, I think I'm a, it's a little bit come back in too much for me to start fading it here. All right, Dennis, we got to get to Equifax, EFX. Oh, this thing this is just stock. continuing to get murdered. Uh, only news really yesterday uh, is that the CEO will be testifying in front of Congress uh, on October 3rd. The uh, U.S. Uh, House Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, but this thing just gets the beats. Ooh, this okay. This is a poster child for something that we say on the show, and Joel Alconan taught me. You know, through the, you know this 18 years I've been with Joel, is don't try to catch the falling knife. Don't try to be a hero and call the bottom. Don't you know? Uh, don't you know? Buy a stock when it's going straight down. Wait for it to stop going down. This has not stopped going down since the news. So, yes, okay, yeah, we had a day where it didn't make a new low. But, you know, that was one day. And then, boom, it you know collapses here once again. I mean, it's just a stock that hasn't found its bottom yet. Price discovery is still happening here after four days of trying to figure it out. So, you know, I know Evercore was coming out when this thing was 120. They're saying to buy it aggressively. Well, they were doing that. Three days later, you already lost 20% almost 25% of your money there, at least 20% of your money. So, you know, it's a bold call for an analyst to come out and say something like that because if the momentum gets going in one direction, this is the momentum market. It can continue and it can be violent, especially when it's to 
the downside. And nobody's interested in this right now. Like you got to think who's going to be coming in here, you know, as institutional money, because that's really what moves price. You know, you can say, oh, high frequency traders are there and you know, it's all high frequency traders. They're providing liquidity to the market, but they're providing a hell of a lot less than this right now because it's obviously moving around so much. But they're not the movers and the shakers. They're more noise. The movers are still institutional money. And you have institutional money looking at this. You know, they're they're all momentum traders too, you know, a lot of these institutions now. A lot of these ETFs are, you know, more momentum as well. And the momentum's completely broken this and obviously going hard to the downside right now. So it's a hard gig to come in here and say, okay, I'm going to be a value investor and this is going to be the bottom. Maybe you'll be happy if you bought it here 10 years from now or five years from now. But like I said yesterday, I was saying two days on the show, I think you can get it cheaper there. And, you know, here we are. You're under 100 bucks here now. I don't know where the bottom is. You know, if you get the bottom here, it's more luck than anything. And there's always going to be somebody that buys the bottom. And they're going to brag about it. They're going to tell you about it. But the other nine people that tried to buy the bottom were all hush-hush. And they didn't get it. So it's difficult to just try to go bottom fishing and call the actual bottom. I'm not even going to try it here. The stock's still going down. So there's no reason for me to jump in this thing and, you know, catch this falling knife. I guess you don't want to be a hero. Is that it? I mean, that's just exactly it with trading Spencer. Don't try to be a hero. And this is, you know, what, you know, a lot of traders and a lot of newer traders get wrong is I'm all about base hits. You know, I'm one of those traders that like the setup. I like to control my risk. How do I control the risk in this thing? I mean, if you were in this yesterday, boom, you know, this thing loses 10% on you in a matter of what, you know, throughout the day, I guess it just kept leaking and leaking and leaking. But I mean, you've got to have a way to control the risk. And you can put any trade on as long as you can control the risk. I mean, if you were trading EFX and saying, okay, well, the 111.17 is going to hold, you know, that was the low on September the 11th, you know, that's where, you know, I'm going to have my out. Well, that's okay. But, you know, when it took it out, when it took it out yesterday, you got to sell. When stocks start making new lows, you got to go. That's what I say. Remember that saying, you know, if you learn anything on the show today. When stocks start making new lows, it's time to go. You don't want to be long a stock making new lows because this stuff can happen. And it can lose 10% just like that, especially when the news is still digesting. I mean, what? We got the, the guy's going to go to court here today. I mean, there's a lot of information still to come out of this. Is it going to have bounces? Is it going to have short squeezes in here eventually? Is it going to have, you know, a dead cap bounce? Yes. But where do we know that price is from? And playing that and trying to call that, that's hard money. It's hard to make money doing that. That's why I like the setups, you know, like getting a setup better and then going with the flow, you know, and and, and that's just a different style of trading. You know, I mean, jumping in here and trading these biggest movers, sometimes it's a, diff a diff difficult gig. And what about, uh, I want to pull up a chart of SYMC, uh, Semantic, because they, they own LifeLock. Remember, they bought LifeLock, uh, I want to say, was November of last year. The cybersecurity stock's been hot, Spencer. Right. Well, what, what's Semantic saying? Well, it's nothing they're saying, but they own LifeLock, and LifeLock is seeing a ton. I'm just seeing headlines every day now that LifeLock is seeing 10%, 20% more um, more traffic and more activity than, than, than usual. Uh, and uh, LifeLock, of course, the, the, the personal information security yeah. uh, company. I don't know how else to describe that. But, uh, you know, it's so directly just, benefiting from EFS. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And if you see the other ones too, look at FireEye. Same story here. You know, it's, this took off. These stocks all took off on the news originally. You know, FireEye was trading around 1570. When that news broke on EFX, it's up a buck since then. You know, a buck on a $15 stock. You're talking about seven, 8% move. So it's a nice move. Semantic, exactly. Same story here. Cyber, uh, CyberArk, not as much, but it's, uh, you know, it's up a, a little bit since then. And then you can think Palo Alto Networks too. It's kind of just been hanging out, but Palo Alto just had a big gap up from their earnings as well. So, you know, the, the direct plays that are benefiting here right now, FireEye and uh, Semantic, that's YMC. So where there's a loser, there's sometimes a winner, and those are your winners here right now. And you mentioned that we don't know everything. We might not know everything about Equifax. October 3rd is when we could know more, which is when the CEO will testify in front of... A long ways away. October the 3rd. Yeah, two weeks away. Yeah, so well, this thing just lost one week, just lost 30%. So a lot can happen before that time there too. So I'm going to let the dust settle on this one. Not going to be here on Try to Catch a Falling Night Knife in EFX. All right, let's move on to iRobot, I-R-B-T. Uh, bit of news yesterday. What was it yesterday? Because this thing got annihilated. Bit of news yesterday. Uh, they are, Shark uh, is entering the uh, robotic vacuum uh, market, which is a, a major competitor. Is this the iRobot. Roomba thing, iRobot? Uh, yes. So they're yes. That's the Roomba stock. Yes. So the little self-vacuuming. 
Did anybody have one of those in the chat? You know, I'm curious how those things work. Because, you know, I like, I had the, I used to have the thing that cleaned my pool, you know, the little thing that goes around automatically. And it takes Wait, forever, right? you know, because it's randomly going around. But this thing, like this uh, Roomba thing, I think it senses the dirt somehow. Like, do you have any experience with this, Spencer? You know anybody that's got a Roomba? No, I want to know about this. Automatic... Am I saying it right, Roomba? Yeah, I want to know about this automatic pool vacuum because I spent thousands of hours in my teenage years vacuuming a pool by man, you know, the old no, fashioned those are way. just the ones you put on the thing, like, and it just bounces around in there and it just slowly does oh. it. I have one at home. Okay. It, it does a good job, but it doesn't sense the dirt. I, I guess know. the Roomba. Colin has one. Colin says it's a life changer. He loves it. Right, I going just... with the Roomba. I looked at one. I looked at one. They're like 300 bucks. So you know how cheap I am. So I'll probably just do it manually. <laughs> my vacuuming. I'm just a little bit freaked out at the idea of uh, like I, I draw the 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 like the ba- the boundary at. Uh, at at like some company knowing the interior layout of my of my of my house like that's what, that, that's <laughs> you think where they're I, transporting I, that I, information back to uh, the company uh, selling the information of course about that of course they are so I, I I'm of o- they are. I, I I'm okay with like Apple knowing like you know my face because I use FaceTime and things like that I have an iPhone and with the facial recognition I'm okay with them knowing my face I draw the line and when they know where my couch is relative to the table and like like that's where I that's where I draw the line. So <laughs> you want a little bit of privacy. Yes, you know? yes, a little bit of privacy there. So I don't have one. I don't plan on getting one. But if they're great, then great. Well, what was the news that drove this thing down 15 points yesterday? Is uh, everybody, everybody have the same concerns you do? Well, no, it, well, it, it, it's just a, a new competitor uh, in in the market. Oh, uh, that the competitor. I forgot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So somebody so, coming in for their space. Yeah. So let's let's look at some price action here. What what do you see? In I'm looking at the the daily chart. The I mean, the thing got murdered yesterday, obviously, and this is, you know, straight down. And when the ball gets going in one direction, we talk about it can continue in that direction. One thing I will say is it often doesn't go away in one day. You know, often when you see these big moves down, you might have a day or two of consolidation, but sometimes a continuation of those moves. I don't see any reason this thing can't trade 80. So there's not that much as a little bit, you know, you could say, oh, well, we, we paused here for about a week and a half in July in this 85 area. But really, you know, the major support is of July, low of 79.40. We just lost 15 points. I can't see why we wouldn't go the other five bucks. So I'm not jumping in here and saying, you know, even though if I like the room button, I don't know much about it. I can't jump in here and because I think, you know, you got more downside work here to do. And again, these things just don't tend to work themselves out in one day. Uh, when you get news, you know, take the EFX news, which was bad news, obviously. But, you know, competitors, you know, they're still digesting. Institutions don't just don't work instantaneously. That's the whole thing. Like you think, okay, well, your day traders maybe all get out or your, some of your retail traders are pretty quick. Your institutions with your big money take sometimes days to get out of position. So sometimes when you see this happening, it could be an institution that's slowly working orders. And they have so much stock sometimes that it can take them a few days to get out of stocks. And that's why it tends to not just work itself out in one day. Plus it sets up for the two-day move. So we are getting a little bit of lift here in the pre-market, maybe a little relief rally. It's trading up a buck. But if it takes out yesterday's low, which I think it could do, I would expect this thing, you know, to potentially maybe even test, uh, you know, the lower 80s today. Uh, but 84.70 would be my bogey. So if that takes that out, when I say the stock makes new low, you got to go. 84.70 is the bogey. Don't I don't want to be long this thing if it takes out that low. All right. Where do you want to go next? We got some earnings. We talked about Juno yesterday and we were uh... – Good on that call. So we can go. Do you know we can well, earnings? Any earnings? There's only like one company really of any note. So United Natural Foods reported it's trading up a couple bucks. Spencer details. UNFI reporting uh, Q4 adjusted EPS of 72 cents versus a 70 cent estimate. Sales of 2.34 billion versus 2.36 billion. So a slight miss on the sales and a slight beat on the EPS. Stock really bounced around last night. I think they said something about an offering too. Do you see that headline? I thought I thought I saw something. A stock bounced, and then I thought I saw I'm something. Not about seeing a, that oh, cursory look. Not seeing. Maybe that. I jumped that up, but I thought I saw that go by the timeline. Anyways, it chopped around a lot last night. So it went up, went down, went left, went right. Well, it didn't go left and right, but it went up and down. UNFI, it's back up here this morning. I mean, if you're looking at this from a technical perspective, you know these these food stocks really haven't been in favor for a long time. So as they start to come back up. They always seem to get met with sellers. I'd expect 40 to be major resistance. If you want to talk more specific, the high on August the 1st at 39.70. That's right where the stock's trading right now. I think that could meet you with some resistance there too. So I'm more of a fader of this rally, I think. But you know, you got, you got to have an out too. So if the stock really started to blow through 40, then it does open up. But I think it could struggle there at 40. All righty. Uh, on to Juno. Uh, we discussed this yeah. on the show yesterday. 
And I've uh, been discussing Juno for three well, days. For so days. one that I got right, I predicted, and I almost made a bet with Joel. Props to you, Dennis. Um, Props I, to you. I thought the stock was going to break out. Um, it had consolidated. We, we talked about it having a nice flag for the last couple of days. I think it wasn't yesterday. I think it was the day before we talked about this having a potential to break out. And a lot of times what you see is a big move, uh, digestion of that move, which we saw you know, through the last two weeks. This thing has been bouncing between 40 and 44 after having the 10-point move up on the kite takeout. So now it breaks out. You're in full breakout mode here in Juno, 45, 32. Um, I think there's room to maybe even 50 on this thing. Um, it's pulling back a little bit here this morning, but you know, unless it's a failed breakout, which you know it can be as well. You know, you always have to be cognizant of that. I I do think this has room. One one I'm watching here that did not move yesterday, Bluebird Bio B L U E, still hanging out here. Still the potential if this thing can get above 130, I would say it's in breakout mode here as well. So keep an eye on Bluebird Bio. It's three bucks away from there. But if uh, you know Juno goes, sometimes the Bluebird Bio follows suit. So we'll have to see what happens. We know Juno has a continuation here, but if it Juno does continue up, it might drag Bluebird up with it. So keep an eye on Blue. Uh, some other biotech news. We have uh, Bristol Myers and and Halo entering into a collaboration agreement. Uh, Halo is to, going to receive one hundred five million dollars uh, upfront. Halo is also announced they announced the licensing of its Enhance uh, to Roach for thirty million dollars uh, upfront. And Halo is also raising their guidance uh, for the fiscal year. So Halo, a lot of headlines this morning. Let's take a look at that chart. I have this thing against Roche, and the reason is and Roche isn't public, but they, they I had a stock, Genentech. If anybody in the chat remembers Genentech, let me know. But it was this t- ticker symbol DNA, awesome ticker symbol. I had it in my portfolio, and I remember this in like 2007, 2008, 2009. You know, I bought it back there. I think those were the years. And um, I had DNA in there, and I was like, I'm going to hold this DNA forever because I think this Genentech is like the future. You know, this is going to be the biotech of all biotechs. And the stock Roche came in and bought them out for cash at 95 and took me out. And that was like in 2011, I think. And I'm like, I did not want to sell it, but I have no choice. I mean, I got bought out for cash. They take your stock away. I bet you if that DNA was still a stock today, I bet you it would be 300 bucks a share. So that was one of the best buys by Roche. And obviously, you know, I had no choice. I had to sell it because they took it away from me. But that's what sucks sometimes. You can, you know, do your homework and, you know, you can really do your research and really like a company. And, you know, I got paid. I made money on it because it got bought out. It was trading at 70, I think, and then it got bought out for 95. But I still wasn't happy because I wanted to hold that one as a long-term investment. So, you know, I made a quick, you know, 25% because it got bought out. But I think it would have been up hundreds of percents because look at what those biotechs have done since then. Like Biogen, you know, for instance, back in 2011, let's just go out to the charts, was a $60 stock, now $324 stock. DNA was like the gun back then. Like it was, you know, it was, you know, what everybody talked about when you talk biotechs. I would bet DNA would be three or $400 a share, or maybe even more if it was still listed. So Roche, you know, had an awesome buy there. So they know what they're doing. You know, that was, a, you know, I went on a tangent there just because you mentioned Roche. But, you know, they know what they're doing, obviously. Um, and when you get them involved, you know, they, they're private. They know what they're doing. Um, Halo, this is a win, windfall for them, obviously. You know, they're getting a big pop here, 18%. Bristol Myers is, just, you know, it's not a big deal for them. Smaller deal, so they're getting a little bit of a lift, but big deal for Halo trading up seventeen percent. I I want to know more about uh, other other trades you made that where you get you got taken out before you wanted to. That's that's interesting. Dell, they got me on Dell Dell Technologies. So you know, I, Dell had been killed. It went from like forty five dollars down to like eight or nine bucks. I scooped up some on the cheap. And, uh, you know, they took it private, I think, at like 10 or 11 bucks. And no choice to take it away from me. They actually did give you shares. I got some shares of DVMT, which is just the VMware tracking stock now. We know that. So it's not really Dell Technologies. But, you know, sometimes it just sucks. Like, sometimes you can really do your homework. And, you know, and when you get bought out for cash, you know, there's no choice. I mean, they take, you know, I didn't sell it. You know, it's just taken away from you once the deal goes through. Stock's gone from your portfolio and there's no choice. I wasn't as, you know, upset about the Dell one, but the DNA, I can remember being upset about it because I really wanted, and you know, the only thing I did do good then when I lost Genentech, I did take a turn around and I bought Celgene and Biogen. And those were one of two of my best buys ever. I mean, I bought Biogen at the $60. I think it was actually $49 I started Biogen, and I bought some more at $60. And obviously, you know, it's $324 here now. I still have some of that stock. I've sold some, 
but I've still have some of that stock, you know, a lot of times, you know, what I like to do is when a stock doubles, sometimes I sell half and then I'm completely playing with the house's money. Sometimes I hold on, but you know, a lot of times I play that theory. I think Kramer's even mentioned that before. Um, you know, when a stock doubles, if it's in your investment portfolio, if you sell half, now you can never really lose on that trade because you got your original investment back out and you're completely playing with the house's money. I did that with MasterCard. I did that with Biogen and Maybe there were mistakes because I sold half of my MasterCard. I think when it doubled, obviously I bought this thing at like sixteen dollars. So I sell at thirty-two or you know or forty or whatever it was on the split adjusted. You know, it's one hundred and forty now. That would have been one to maybe never sell. But I'm still holding the other of uh, the other half. So I guess I'm still doing okay. A lot of stocks come out of the chat, so let's get to them right now. We got uh, okay. Spinner mentioning Baba. He's saying two insiders are are set to sell. Uh, also, I'm watching this morning the fact that uh, Trump blocked the uh, the uh, LSCC uh, lattice semiconductor from uh, acquiring, uh, or I'm sorry, Ken Bridge from acquiring lattice semiconductor due to um, Chinese influence there. So that could potentially affect the Baba uh, MoneyGram uh, merger that we saw from a few months ago, but what thoughts on Baba right now? Well, Baba, this was announced last night, was a plan for, um, you know, a, basically setting up to sell stock over the course of time. So for your, your you know, your insiders and that to actually sell. Uh, I don't know if you have the actual headline because I'm butchering it. But, you know, this wasn't just like a one-time deal to, for that some insiders are selling. They were setting up a plan to slowly, you know, sell stock for I, I think probably yeah here it is alibaba executive set up plan to sell shares alibaba says 16 million shares represent nine percent of jack ma's stake in the company so basically jack ma is going to be lightening up you know and this is something you know that bill gates does something that everybody does i mean you know just sometimes when you have all your money and all your eggs in one basket it's sometimes you know nice to set up a plan to sell stock over the course of time you know on microsoft bill gates at one time i think was selling like an insane amount of stock because he just had so much Microsoft stock. I, you know, I think it was something like you know eighty thousand shares a week or something like that. Set up for years just to sell slowly, sell that much, just to slowly diversify himself out and and do some other stuff. And you know, now he's got a lot of money in other companies as well. Um, Warren Buffett never does that. He keeps all of his money in Berkshire Hathaway. He always says, you know, if you buy my stock, you know, 100% of your worth is going to move with 100% of mine because I have 100% of my money in Berkshire Hathaway. But that's, you know, and, you, know, a hedge, you know, it's a fund in itself because it's natural diversification because they are buying other companies. So I don't know if I have a big problem with Jack Ma. I don't think I see it as, whoa, Jack Ma is selling. You got to get out. I see this Jack Ma has all his money or probably a bulk of his money in Alibaba. And he wants to diversify himself out a little bit. And the stock's had a hell of a run. But, you know, this morning here, you can look at Baba and it's obviously down two bucks. So not good news. You know, when you get some insiders that are going to be putting some selling pressure on some stock and that's why it's trading down. And obviously the tracking stock, Alt Baba, A-A-B-A, trading down in sympathy as well. I'm pretty sure it's Alt Baba, but I called it Alt Baba. <laughs> Alt Baba. It's Alt Baba. It's Alt Baba. It's Alt Baba, I think. Whatever. Not the point. The alternate Baba. Okay. <laughs> so fine. ridiculous. Fine. The old Yahoo. Is, is now just a tracking stock rally, Baba, A-A-B-A. All right, Dennis, thoughts on Sage? We, of course, had some negative uh, drug data uh, from Sage back on Tuesday where they missed uh, the primary endpoint uh, for one of their drugs. Again, the question here from uh, chat on Sage. Uh, again, hard to just say, okay, well, that was the low. You know, it got hit really hard, 90 down to 67. Didn't make a new low yesterday, so that's the good news, 69.50. If for whatever reason I'm buying this, that's my out. If it takes up the low of 67, I don't want any part of it. Again, I will say when a stock makes a new low, you got to go. I guess that's the theme for today. If it takes up the 67, I'd be out. So if I'm buying this for a trade or even, you know, as a long-term investment, I don't want it if it's below 67. If you're saying that 67 is going to hold, you're making a call, maybe you're hoping it's going to bounce back. Typically, these things don't bounce right back. Although Sage has been a darling. Sage has been in a hard uptrend here. Now you get a break of that trend. So mm, I, I, I'm torn here on this one. You know, I could argue, you know, well, it's still kind of in the uptrend here, but that was a really ugly candle yesterday. All right, moving down in the chat, a lot of tickers. I'm seeing Cajun Juan mentioning TransUnion. Too much of a sympathy move in re in response to uh, Equifax. And Downward Dog is mentioning uh, AMLP. Uh, actually, we've had uh, we've had them on the show, I believe. Uh, and so, wh where do you want to go? We can go to uh, TransUnion, AMLP, which is uh, an MLP. 
Um, we can go to all those. Uh, AMLP is uh, an, an MLP, obviously. That stock is starting to look like a little bit of life to it, you know, breaking out a little bit on, you know, potential breakout there. These things don't move around a lot. They're more about their dividend, though. Right. So that's the consideration here. I mean, this thing has a 9.9% yield here. So, you know, these things, you know, you're not going to see a stock like this bounce up a buck or really break out. You're buying these things for the dividend. That's the way that most of the MLPs are. So they kind of just, you know, hang out, and, you know, sometimes actually drift down, but they're paying you dividends too so that's a consideration those are pure dividend plays um the other stock tru i don't follow this company really but i can tell you it was an ugly candle yesterday obviously losing four bucks whether it's sympathy or not um you know if it takes out yesterday's low that's a concern so 43.16 you know i like my two-day moves though that does set up it is bouncing a buck here this morning though so maybe there's a potential that the 43.16 low holds but that would be my bogey that's what it needs to hold all right, 831. We had a number come out at 830 here, and the financials just got a lift, Spencer. Uh, what was it? Did we have some uh, CPI data? Uh, let me look real quick. Yeah, we, yep, we did have CPI data uh, for August, 0.2%. That was the estimate. The prior was 0.10%. Uh, of course, of course, CPI was uh, was fine, and, and it was it was what it was what they expected. Uh, CPI year over year uh, is up uh, 10 basis points. And banks are bouncing on this. They were down fairly significantly before the number. I just saw Bank of America go to the green. Uh, JP Morgan just uh, bounced back up a little bit there too. Morgan Stanley, not a huge bounce, but I am seeing life in the banks here now as they were looking pretty ugly there before. Bank of America is always the one I look to first because BAC uh, is the most liquid one. So it usually is the one that responds the fastest and you can read it a little bit better. And it is bit up here now on a day that we're down. So I guess the banks are liking that CPI data. Maybe they think interest rates could go up. Maybe, maybe. 832, three more minutes to work till we're gonna uh, bring Gene Munster on the show to discuss uh, Apple and uh, augmented reality and Tesla and all the best tech stocks. But before we do that, Dennis, quick opening and balance look. Yeah, let's take a look here. Okay. Uh, Bank of America, which I just mentioned, um, 134000 to sell. But again, it's uh, now showing some buys here. So wouldn't be surprised if that does flip. Square SQ had a decent day yesterday. Actually got killed off the open and then bounced all the way back. Uh, Square here, 167000 to buy this morning. So Square is still showing some life. Uh, one thing I will say is there's the world for sale up there at 28 bucks. So um, that's the big bogey. It got up to 2797 back in July 27th when I looked at my uh, open buck nyob i saw some huge size up there 28 so i think that's the first major resistance if it ever takes out 28 it would be in breakout mode uh disney 28,000 to buy i'm still short disney you know what i covered half of it and i'm sticking with the other half and now i'm looking at it here and i'm like i wish i would have covered it all so i covered back at 96 and in, in the mid 96s now it's you know, approaching 99 bucks and now I think, you know, it could go to 100. I think it gets back up to 100. I might actually lay out some more on the short side. We'll see. But uh, Disney with a small buy and balance is one of 28,000 shares. Baba with a buy and balance, 31,000 shares. That's not going to last, I don't think, because obviously stock trade down significantly. You're going to have other institutions that are going to come in and offset that. Uh, Kroger, KR, 49,000 to buy. That's somewhat significant here. Kroger is still showing a little bit of life after it did not make a new low. Well, it kind of did by five cents, but I'll call that a double bottom because it's close enough in this nickel world. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the low from June and then the low from September. Those almost are perfect. So, you know, Kroger is showing life here. And, you know, some of the other grocers as well. I wouldn't be surprised, KR, you know, if I can maybe get back up for 22, it'd, it'd show even more life. Alrighty, 834 now. So we are going to take our first break of the day and grab one of our favorite guests, Gene Munster. He was formerly of Piper Jaffrey, now uh, runs uh, a venture capital firm called Loop Ventures. So Gene is going to talk us through uh, the Apple event from a couple of days ago, what that means going forward. I'm sure we're going to hit on uh, Amazon, we'll hit on Google, we'll hit on Tesla. We'll, of course, take your questions from the chat. So we'll be right back with Gene monster.
Welcome back, everyone, to Ben's English Pre-Market Prep. I'm Spencer Israel here with Dennis Dick. We're on the line with one of our favorite guests, Gene Munster, formerly of Piper Jaffrey, now of Loop Ventures. Gene, how's it going today? Doing super. Thanks. All right. Let's get right to it and get your reaction from the Apple event from a couple of days ago. We saw a new Apple Watch where you don't have to have your phone with you. We saw a bunch of new iPhones, so many new iPhones. What was your reaction uh, to the event? The biggest is this larger iPhone X with the higher ASP, I think is going to have a measurable impact on the model. And I think a lot of consumers and investors believe that people will not buy the more expensive phone. But I think that was probably the biggest takeaway was that this phone should have some good adoption. Um, I don't know about you, but I was a little bit uh, disappointed uh, at the end when he said one more thing, one more thing. I was kind of hoping for maybe a new product line, and then it was just another iPhone. It seems like every time it's just another iPhone. Uh, you believe Apple's real future comes as a services company. So how did Tuesday's event sort of coalesce with that thesis? Well, they, it really didn't. I think those one more thing words are very special words for Apple. And I, I think the uh, idea of just one more iPhone wasn't as exciting. But the services is a huge part of the story. And the iPhone drives services. So services are 12% of revenue today. They're growing about 20%. Investors should pay more for this services revenue because it's more predictable. We're modeling for close to 20% services growth in the next four years. So I think that when you're concerned about hardware and ASPs and how this fluctuates, I think the services piece is an important component. Gene, what about the watch? So this is, looks, looks like where they're going to start to focus their attention here. I mean, they're talking about you know the watch coming in and um, you know being able to you know make calls from your watch, and you know you don't have to carry the physical phone around with you. How does that kind of fit in? You know, with you know, does that going to start to cannibalize their own iPhone sales, or what are your thoughts here as they start to focus more on the watch? Well, the watch is three percent of sales today, and we have it going to four percent next year. But to get to that 4%, we have a significant growth in the watch business. Before they announced the Model 3 watch, we were looking for 9% growth. Now we're looking for 75% growth in that segment. I think to and so I want to first point out is that this is a significant increase in the value proposition of the watch is having this cellular capability. Think of this as an iPhone for uh, really wealthy people for the weekends. Is you don't, uh, you'll still have an iPhone which gets to the cannibalization question, is that even though you don't need an iPhone with you for this watch, you still need an iPhone to set up the watch. And so they probably are not going to cannibalize uh, their iPhone business uh, from this watch. But I'm optimistic that this uh, will have an impact on the model. And to kind of bring it full circle is our numbers, our growth rate from the watch kind of goes from our previous model before the event was 12% growth for next year. Now we go to 14% growth, and then we actually raised our ASPs on our iPhone a little bit, which got us to 15%. So the street's at about 14% today. What are your thoughts? I'll just take you back to the iPhone X. What are, you, what are your thoughts here as you look at this? And, you know, they come out with two iPhones at the same time, which is a little bit confusing to me as a consumer. I mean, I don't know why you come out with the 8 and then the 10. I mean, why would I buy? I guess if you're cheap, you maybe buy the 8. But it seems like that 10's got a lot of, you know, cool gadgets there. Are they going to even be able to sell these 8s when they come out with the 10 at the same time? I think that the the mix, we, we model out uh, mix by skew, and they have a lot of skews going uh, starting with the iPhone 6, which came out in September 2014, all the way up to the iPhone X. And so we model it by SKU. And the answer is, is that we're expecting 20% of the units to be Model X and about 26% to be the Model 8. So slightly more Model 8s than Model Xs. I, I think the, the best way to, to um, try to conceptualize the demand for the X and, and to answer your question is, how do I think about it? is if we would say that the iPhone 6 on a product scale was a 10, and that caused Apple's uh, growth rate to go from roughly 10% to about 35% during that period. And I would say that the Model X is probably an 8, and everything we've seen for the last three years from the hardware side has been more like a 5. So all those numbers, if you put it together, the message is, is that this is a really important product, the X. Um, it is going to have a, a measurable impact on the business, especially on ASPs. 
and but it's not going to have the same impact as uh, the model, uh, uh, the iPhone 6, a few years ago. Uh, Gene, you wrote in, uh, in a note uh, at following uh, Tuesday's event that uh, sort of the, the iPhone X hints at uh, a, a post-smartphone uh, world. So give us your thoughts on how the iPhone X kind of fits into the overall augmented reality picture, because that's something that, of course, we know Apple is very interested in. There are some augmented reality capabilities of the iPhone X. So how does this fit into, uh, how does this move augmented reality forward? They're small steps and they're doing everything right. And just to kind of conceptualize this is today the iPhone is two thirds of Apple's business. In 10 years, it's probably 25 or 30% of the business. And the other kind of call it the piece that goes away is gonna be replaced by some form of a wearable, which is really optimized around augmented reality. So Tim Cook talked about the significance of the new campus and the significance of the next decade and issue in the next decade. And that's really what they're getting to is augmented reality, which begs the question of who cares? And the answer is today, not many people because we're just starting. Their developer platform came out in June and they have some, um, some features around AR on the hardware side, especially this 3D mapping camera that's just front facing today. But we'll start to care more when the apps start to come out. And I think what we will see is a gradual transition to being able to essentially interact with our phone in a more seamless way. Today, we use a touch screen to do that, but within an AR future, you can interact with your phone by a glance or a gesture, uh, your voice, uh, maybe even your thoughts. And so I know that all sounds uh, maybe crazy futuristic, but that's at the core of what Apple's trying to do is slowly lay the groundwork to that. Compare that to what Google did a few years ago when they came out with glass and kind of surprised the market and it didn't have as much utility. That didn't work, but I think Apple's measured approach here over the next decade will will yield result, positive results. Well, if, if you're a believer in augmented reality, and I think you are, Gene, I think I am as well, is Apple the best way to play that, or are there other plays out there? Like, I mean, is there more direct plays than, you know, buying Apple? Because I've had a lot of tr um, friends, you know, that are interested in investing. They're like, this AR is the future, you know, we got to jump in this. Is there some other companies that we can look at, or is it just like an Apple Google play? Is that the best way to play it? You could play the supply chain, and that's always a dicey game, but, you know, like um, Lumentum and Finisar have this 3D mapping chips and they're on the front of the camera today front of the phone today in the future that's you can just see the product roadmap uh, uh I'll, I'll kind of put a dollar bet that a year from now apple comes out with this advanced kind of mapping stuff on the rear camera but so that's one way to play it apple's probably the best way the other way to play it is um you know this is i, I work at a uh, do research at a venture firm now as we invest in companies and private companies it's sim very similar to what happened in uh mobile is that there were some mobile apps that really um, took off and uh, they were private companies initially. I mean, if you think of uh, take or leave it, but you think of like Uber and Airbnb and hotel tonight, all those companies were uh, ways that you couldn't play them publicly, but capitalized on the, the whole app store uh, revolution. Uh, Gene, if I can bring it back uh, to, to the iPhone X real quickly, uh, Talk me, reassure the people who are freaked out about the facial recognition uh, unlocking the phone because uh, that seems a little bit dystopian. I think if you're over 40, you're freaked out. I think if you're between 30 and 40, you're trying to figure it out. I think if you're <laughs> under 30, you don't care. Um, <laughs> under 30, it grew That's up great. the future. So um, it's, it is... Uh, this is just the progression of technology. And, you know, the, I think there's the more substance debates on my end are around uh, implanting chips. And I think that this facial recognition stuff is just an, an extension of what we've done with uh, touch ID and, and fingerprint reading and other biometrics. All right. So you heard Gene Munster, folks. The real issue will come in five years when we talk about chips. Don't worry about this. So the real, the real stuff will come down the road. Gene Munster, he's the managing partner of Loop Ventures, L-O-U-P Ventures is his firm. Gene, thank you so much for coming on. As always, love talking to you. Thank you. Have a great day. All right, you too.
Uh, Dennis, that was a good chat, but as someone is bringing up in the chat, AG Penn and the chat, S&P futures are uh, it's taking a bit of a slide right now. Yeah, this is the CPI data still digesting here, and they're starting to hit, and even the banks have turned. So the banks were trading higher there on the original news. Now they've actually turned to the red as well. So uh, interesting here, if you look at the TLT, it's trading up a little bit here. Gold caught a little bit of a bit as well. A little bit of movement here on the S&Ps. You know, I like seeing movement. As a trader, it's nice to see movement. Again, hard for me to get excited on the short side here, though, because it's just such a resilient S&P. And even if we get a little bit of a pullback, and we do get these days, you know, you pull back 100, 200 points the odd day on the Dow. But, you know, overall, it seems like, you know, when the dust settles, people just, there's new buyers. You know, underneath demand is the term me and Joel have been using for the last year. Every time we pull back in the S&Ps, there's underneath demand as more portfolio managers or, you know, ETFs that need to buy. Come scooping up stock on the cheap. Uh, and then Brent Slava uh, coming through here. I was just talking to him uh, about, about you know, the data we got at 8.30. And he noted something that I, I'd overlooked, actually, that uh, the expectation for initial jobless claims was at 300,000. And it hasn't been over that uh, for years, expectation for for initial jobless claims. That was, that was a high estimate. So even though it came in uh, better than expected, the uh, the expectation was 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 crazy high. So that, that may be something to, to just something to think about, some food for thought uh, yeah. while you digest that. Dennis, let's get into some ratings because we had a lot. We, talk, we, we teased we it. Need, we need the last 10 minutes to cover all these ratings, I think. There, <laughs> there are a lot. There are a lot. There's so a lot. What, what, give us some highlights, Spencer. Where do you want to go? We'll talk stocks about it. I'm going to pull up my Benzinga Pro uh, actually on, on the screen here and give you a, a sense of what I am looking at. So give me one second to do that because we got a lot of ratings going on this morning. Here is what's going on in ratings and i'm going to search it by the action sort by x here we go a lot of upgrades this morning who so southern upgrade at guggenheim neutral to buy uh wells fargo is upgrading raymond james don't see that too often uh market perform to outperform <sighs> city group upgrading new core neutral to buy bernstein upgrading key corp uh citizens financial and huntington bank shares uh all to outperform barclay is upgrading vmware to overweight and uh, those are sort of the big key bank also upgrading rider uh, to overweight. So, and those I are saw new. Did you say new core too? Upgraded yes. by City? Yes, I did. That's a big one too. And then Hertz, the Hertz downgraded to underweight at Morgan Stanley is a big call as well. Because Hertz, let's start with that one. HT Zebra getting downgraded to underweight. They're concerned about valuation here. I'm just concerned overall on the rental car market. I've talked about this before. It's been a hell of a run here for both Hertz and Avis budget. I think they were helped a bit by the hurricane as well. I just wonder, you know, long term if Uber isn't going to eat their lunch. I mean, I think they already were. I think that's why the stocks went from 50. If you look at Hertz, went from 50 down to eight. Now it's back here at 23 bucks. I think there might be some people saying, hmm, you know, this is a nice little rally that we've had here for a while, but really the trend is still not your friend. The overall trend, even though the short term trend is up, the long term trend is still down and there's still some things to worry about. Fundamentally speaking, you know, when you think about competition from Uber. So um, I kind of agree with this call from Morgan Stanley on the downgrade to underweight. And I think this could actually, you know, maybe kickstart a little bit of a sell off and maybe kill the, the trend here that we saw as the stocks went from eight to 24, which I think a lot of it was a short squeeze. So, you know, I look at car, same thing, CAR is trading down significantly here in the pre-market as well, probably off the backs of this uh, note here from Morgan Stanley. It's down 4% in the pre-market. you got a big analyst coming in here and giving some bearish comments now, and I wonder if this does, isn't the catalyst that starts to take some money out of these two stocks. Uh, I think maybe the busiest uh, analyst of the morning was J.P. Morgan. Uh, so a lot of downgrades here from J.P. Morgan. They're downgrading Toll Brothers to underweight from neutral TOL. Downgrading OPK, uh, Opco Health, uh, overweight to neutral. Downgrading Hess, uh, overweight to neutral. Downgrading Apache, uh, neutral to underweight. Uh, and I think I got them all. Yeah, those are all the, the J.P. Morgan downgrades this morning. So Look at them raining on our parade here. J.P. Morgan getting all bearish on us. They weren't totally bearish, though, because they did upgrade Beezer Homes. So from those home builders, they downgrade toll. They upgrade Beezer Homes. I guess they want you to sell your toll and buy the BZH. Um, you know, you look at the Toll Brothers, it's had a hell of a run here, too, the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's went from 37 to 40. That's a big move for the Toll Brothers. Um, you know, I think the hurricane, you know, we never talk much about the housing stocks, but I 
don't think it hurt them either because obviously, you know, if you had some you know major devastation down there, you might have to rebuild some homes. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that happened. So I look at it now, Toll Brothers, 3965, had some resistance up at 40. So I'm kind of, you know, often I fade the analysts, but I'm not sure I'm fading them here in this case. Uh, I think Toll Brothers could be down a little bit here, obviously, with this downgrade and get back some of that recent move from the 37 area. You know, you think about a 50% retracement would take you back down to about 38 and a half. Not sure that's going to happen today, but these downgrades do have some momentum sometimes. What Another one I want to talk was VMware, yep. Spencer. I don't know if you mentioned that one. VMware getting upgraded overweight at Barclays. The stock has been an absolute monster. Um, if you just look at it, it's went from 85 back in July, now 110 bucks. Trading up at 111.60 just on odd lot here this morning. But, you know, price target upgrade overweight. Barclays raising it. Uh, price target 130 bucks. Looks like you have a little bit more strength here again today. Uh, VMware, DVM, DVMT is obviously a tracking stock for that too, so I have to watch that one if you're trading it. Full disclosure, I am long some DVMT. Um, VMware, though, has been moving in Barclays, jumping on maybe a little bit late to the party, though. What about some initiations? We're going to talk about those too often, but we had a, sure. couple, a couple of good ones today. Deutsche Bank initiating Burlington stores at a buy a $108 price target on BURL. It's a big price target. BURL, you know, actually starting to look okay on the charts here too. We've had some major resistance just under 90 bucks. We took it out yesterday, got up to 92.08. It settled back. You know, the retail stocks, we've been talking about this, have been quietly having a pretty good time here the last three or four weeks. You know, Macy's has come back. Kohl's has come significantly back. I mean, Kohl's was 37 bucks three weeks ago. It's now $44. So, you know, you saw a lot of these retailers, these department stores, and, you know, also the apparel retailers coming back. Uh, TJX has been drifting up here for a while. So, you know, Burlington looks like it sets up not bad. You know, it's a little bit of a breakout yesterday, pulls back, you know, around that 90, you know, it gives you a shot and you just think here, maybe there's some upside there, but there is life in the apparel stocks and Burlington, you know, is, is, is discount apparels, which never got hit as hard as the main department stores. Like we know Nordstrom, Kohl's, um, you know, Macy's, Dillard's have all been annihilated because they're, you know, your high end department stores. The, 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 Cheaper department stores like the TJX and the Burlingtons have held up better. And that's where the consumers were really flocking to. If you just go up to the charts, you can see when they were flocking to it. Back, uh, I'm just taking you out to the monthlies there. Back out in TJX in you know, mid-2016 when we made new highs. Burlington was doing the same thing. Burlington actually made new highs this year, just in May when it broke over $100. So, you know, the consumer has been, you know, moving into, you know, those discount department stores. And, you know, here's a stock that's, you know, off from the highs, but, I wouldn't be surprised to start showing some life here, too. I kind of like these analyst calls today. Usually, I kind of like to gang up on them, you know, and besides, you know, the VMware one, which is a little bit chasing. I mean, you know, some of these are pretty, you know, you know pretty sensible calls here from some of these analysts this morning. They're doing their homework. Uh, another initiation, D.A. Davidson initiating, I guess you can call it the specialty retail space. Uh, so uh, quotient, Q-U-O-T is a buy. Grubhub is neutral. QVC is a buy. Wayfair is neutral. And eBay is a buy at D.A. Davidson. So uh, eBay, QVC, quotient buys, Grubhub, and Wayfair neutral there from D.A. Davidson. QVCA is the ticker QVC, on QVC. Yes, yes QVC. yeah, it's called QVC, but they throw the A on there at just so it makes it confusing. But yeah, yeah. so analysts, analysts busy here. Ryder also catching an upgrade at Key Bank there. I'm not sure if we mentioned that one. Symbol R, uh, that stock's trading up a little bit in the pre market as well. Uh, 80 has been major resistance for that too. So we'll see. It looks like you know, they, you know, the S&Ps are pulling back a little bit. We're getting a little bit of selling pressure in stocks overall, but. You know, really, when you put it in perspective, you're down a quarter of a percent here. So it's not that much. Uh, if I do give you another look at imbalances here, Home Depot is 51000 to buy now. HD uh, is trading up a little bit in the pre-market despite the market being down. So still showing a little bit of life there. I mean, these banks have turned. They're all turned red here now. They were green there for a little bit right after the CPI data, and then they pulled the rug out from under them, and now they're all red here again. General Motors, we haven't talked about it, but General Motors and Ford have both been showing life here as well. GM does have a sell balance this morning, 31,000 shares. It did just tick down 30 cents on the day. Um, 38 is big for this. It needs to stay above 38 to continue the breakout mode there. But, you know, as much as we've talked about Tesla and as much as we've talked about you know, them, you know, eating Ford and GM and going to be, you know, what takes them out, you know, like, you know, a lot of people think, you know, GM and Ford are, are in trouble because of, you know, electric cars. Um, you know, GM is showing a hell of a lot of life. 
it's right up here at the highs that it made in 2016, 2017. You still get the nice dividend of 4%. Not only that, in the last couple of weeks, you've been buying, you've been getting paid in the stock too. Stocks went from 35 to 38 bucks. So big move here for GM. Ford, same thing. Ford has moved up nicely from that 1050 low when everybody threw it out. 1162. I still have Ford in my invest portfolio. I'm still looking to lighten it up though, somewhere in here. So I'm not sure. I'm a complete believer in this rally in Ford and GM, but it's nice that they show some life, especially in the Motor City. Uh, one headline I saw this morning, uh, if you were banking on Verizon and maybe buying a cable company, uh, maybe time to stop holding uh, your breath and give it up. Verizon, Chairman and CEO speaking this morning at the Goldman Sachs Communicopia conference says that they've moved on from potentially acquiring a cable company. Of course, they've long been rumored uh, to be in Hawks with Charter communications uh, among others but uh you know verizon uh, says they're out of the cable game so if you're thinking of maybe a competitor to the new at&t time warner conglomerate maybe not so fast and direct tv remember at&t was yes. just scooping everybody and up direct they TV, scooped up direct tv yes. too so you know verizon's kind of been hanging out and not doing them much so and they're saying they're not gonna that's what hmm. they say they're not gonna do it they've moved on so well, not. Verizon showing life yesterday. I mean, a lot of times they do hit stocks when they pay a premium. You know, if they were to pay a premium for charter, they would probably would have, you know, hit the Verizon a little bit on it. So maybe the yesterday's rally in Verizon is, you know, a little bit indicative that, you know, maybe they're excited and the market likes the fact that they might not uh, be paying up for charter. Uh, the 49 bucks, for whatever reason, and, and you know, Verizon is a slow, you know, stodgy old stock. It doesn't move very quickly. So, you know, I'm looking at this thing. It moved, you know, fairly quickly from 49 down to 46. It's out of 47 a quarter. The world of resistance up there, 49. So that's a buck and a half away from here. Am I coming in here and buying it today? I only see about a buck and a half of upside. AT&T has had a nice rally the last few days. It got pretty annihilated for AT&T going from 39 to 35. Like these stocks typically trade 20, 30 cents, you know, and sometimes get range bound for weeks on end because of the, the heavy dividends. I mean, these stocks, AT&T pays a 5.37% dividend. Verizon is a 5.02% dividend. These stocks trade more like bonds. And they actually often trade along with interest rates, you know, talk more than even their own company fundamentals. So these are kind of like listed bonds. They sometimes do move with their own company fundamentals. But interest rates are always the thing that moves AT&T and Verizon more than anything else. All right. 8.59 now, Dennis. I'm going to let you go. And I'm going to take a quick break and grab our second guest of the day. That is Sandy uh, Chaikin. I think I think she's been on the show once before. She's uh, very interesting, I think, uh, really in relating to this show because she doesn't does not have a background uh, in finance. And only uh, later in life did she begin to take an interest in her portfolio after the financial crisis and really has uh, spent the, the, you know, the last 10 years really uh, – learning how to manage a actively manage a portfolio uh and and out, try to outperform the market so she's going to come on and tell us how exactly uh she did that and dennis i'm gonna let you go so have a good day dennis and we'll be right back with our second guest of the day sandy chicken
Welcome back, everyone, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel here with Sandy Chaikin. She is uh, a someone without, like I mentioned before the break, without a career in finance, but who recently over the last decade took control uh, of, her, of her portfolio. Sandy, how's it going today? It's going great, Spencer. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks for coming on. So I guess we'll start off with 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 that. Uh, you know, your husband has been on our show before, Mark Chaikin, of course, a a a career uh, a market uh, veteran. Uh, you uh, only really uh, began actively managing your portfolio after the financial crisis. So, uh, wh- how how did you go about doing that? Well, actually, I, it was it was pretty simple, uh, Spencer. After the whole two thousand eight nine financial meltdown, I lost uh, significant years off of my uh, investments. So my, my account was down by 40%, which was a totally devastating uh, experience. And that really got me committed and, and mad, I have to say, about uh, losing all that money because uh, I was with a wealth manager who kept insisting that I stay in the market and not uh, sell as the market was tanking. And because I lacked the confidence, I took his, his advice. I thought, well, gee, he's a professional. He, he, he knows what to do better than I do. And, um, you know, after losing 40%, I, I, I was devastated. So I said, I've got to learn how to manage my own money. Um, you know, this is women, women in particularly who outlive men really need to know because we need to be able to support ourselves through our retirement. And, so I, this actually was the, the incentive for Mark and I starting our company, Chaikin Analytics, so that he could take all of his learning from the 40-some years he had on Wall Street, giving uh, pros the tools that they needed. And then he said, well, gee, you know, there's, there's billions of dollars that have come out of traditional brokerage firms like mine when I closed my account and put it in a self-managed Vanguard account. And he said, you know, you guys, uh, it's great, Sandy, that you're managing your own money, but you don't have the expertise or the the knowledge or the uh, tools to know what you're doing, which was absolutely true. So it's like, okay, I want to do this, but now how do I do this? So he said, what uh, what I'm going to do is uh, give individuals the same professional quality tools that the pros use, but give it in a way that they can understand. And I said, fine, I'm, I'm on board with that. And with my background in marketing, I will help marketing, help market the company. So that, that was how we started. So I guess it was from me first getting incredibly discouraged and disappointed with Wall Street, getting mad, and then deciding I, I had to take action. I had to take control. So it's kind of a long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> Spencer, but um, you know that's really how I got started and how I've continued to build a portfolio since inception that's outperformed the S and P five hundred and most money managers. So, so give so, us, so give us it, some ideas right now. Not that hard. Give us some ideas right now. What stocks do you have on your radar? Um, it's not my radar. It's the radar of our chicken power gauge, which is the stock rating model that is the centerpiece of our workstation and our platform. Um, we are very bullish on companies uh, such as Cigna, uh, CI, uh, Lamb Research. You know, we've that's been bullish for a long time. LRCX, um, Carlyle Group, CG, uh, Brooker, that's B R K R. And DR Horton, which is DHI. Now, all of these stocks I either own now or have recently owned, selling to take a profit. Um, but they're all rated very bullish in our system. So it's not what I think or what Mark thinks um, or what anyone thinks. It's really we go by these objective, uh, the objective stock rating model that Mark has created that combines 20 factors that are the 20 factors the pros look at every day when they're evaluating the stock. This is, this is what I was referring to when I said Mark would, said he'd create something with very easy displays, but it was incredibly powerful. And so we're very bullish on, the, on, those, on those five stocks, among others. But, you know, I, I, as I say, it's not really what I think. It's what the power gauge rating says. 
And that looks at a stock's potential three to six months out. And if it's rated very bullish, that's saying the stock is likely to go up over the ensuing three to six months. Uh, Sandy, uh, I believe you're you're hosting a webinar. Uh, I think it's today. Yes, 4:15 Eastern. Uh, you're hosting a webinar, a five-step guide to finding uh, winning stocks in 15 minutes a day. Give us a quick sort of preview uh, of that. Well, I think if anyone's serious about their investing, um, they invest because they want a better life. They want a new house, they want a new car, they want to fund their ch child's education, they want a vacation, you know, whatever it is that motivates you, um, you're investing to create that wealth that will give you a better life, right? Um, so that's what, that's what I show people how to do. And I've built, broken it down into a very simple uh, five-step process. And I walk our listeners through that by explaining exactly what those five steps are, what, what the kind of the rules are, the criteria, showing them with examples from my own criteria, own portfolio with, with stocks, uh, such as what I've just uh, shown you on the bullish side, how I, how I read that chart, how I knew when to buy it, how I knew when to sell it. And that is exactly what I walk our registrants through on on my uh, presentations and find so that they can do it findwinningstocks.com is the url for that i threw the link in the chat but it is simple findwinningstocks.com uh, for the webinar today uh from sandy chicken at 4 15 uh eastern time sandy thank you so much for coming on and uh, have a good rest of your day and good luck out there all right spencer thank you and i hope to see you all on the webinar this afternoon all righty that is our show for the day, folks. A busy, busy morning. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you have a good rest of your day. Don't forget, you can catch the whole thing again on our podcast, on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher, or just listen to the show live as it aired, uh, or as it aired live, I should say, on youtube.com slash TV. So that's it for us. Again, good luck out there. Have a good day. We'll be back with you folks on Friday.